I'm going to down. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Wolfpack Wellness Research web series. That is a mouthful. I'm your host, Dr. Susie Goodell. This series is a collaboration between the University Wellness Advisory Committee, the NC State Libraries, and NC State's Wellness and Recreation. We aim to discuss wellness research happening across NC State's campus. For those of you joining us live today via Zoom, you can submit your questions to our speaker in the chat box, and we'll have a Q&A time at the end of the show. Today, I'm delighted to have our guest, Dr. Bob Patterson. He was born and raised in Western North Carolina, receiving both his bachelor's and master's from NC State College, as he says, it wasn't a uh, university, university back then. Yeah. After obtaining his doctorate degree from Cornell University, he came back to the then NC State University to teach numerous courses related to crop science and global public health and to conduct research on plant water relations in a changing global environment. And thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Patterson. Thank you for the opportunity, Susie. You are so kind to give me a, an opportunity to talk to, to people that I really want to talk to. And, and I look forward to hearing your questions and, and hopefully providing a decent response after my formal remarks. Yeah, so my first comment is tell me a little bit about the work you do. Tell me you know, what, what drives you in your passion for teaching and research. What a question. And the answer is very straightforward. When I take my students on a field trip, we go to, on a lot of field trips, for example, to our agroecology farm mm -hmm. at Lake Wheeler here on our campus or to a community supported agriculture. We know this now with the acronym is CSA to a farm where a farm family has made a decision to invest at least some of their re land resource in community supported agriculture to strengthen the community. And the students wander around and we talk about all that's being done at that location. And then I say to the class students, uh, we need to get back on the vehicle, it's time to saddle up because I wanna get you back to campus on time. And the students say, can we stay a little longer? Do we have to leave now? When a student says that, Susie, that tells me that we've, taking the students where they feel that they can benefit from having experience and it's empowering. So being given the opportunity to introduce our students to how we provide food, feed, fiber, and specialty crops and all that entails, being able to help our students think more deeply and broadly about their food. This is a, this is a blessing for me to have this opportunity and I really appreciate it. Thank you. So we've talked a little bit before starting this interview about the work you're doing with between the connection between soil health and human health. And I think our viewers would love to hear more about what what we know about, first of all, what is soil? And then the connection, how do you measure soil health and that connection between soil health and human health? That's a lot of questions in there. There's a lot of questions. I can give you a very straightforward answer. Um, and that answer comes from the plant that's growing in the soil. We'll know that our soil is healthy when the plant tells us that it's comfortable, it's happy, and it feels very comfortable about being able to do what it's genetically predisposed to do, which is to complete its life cycle another generation. Mm -hmm. Soil health is a very complicated subject. Uh, we sometimes say that the soil quality determines soil health. These are related terms. And soil health is a manifestation of being respectful of both the living, the biotic, and the non-living, the abiotic components of the soil and putting all of it in proper balance in a way that we feel we not only are sustainable, but we also are regenerative. And I'm making a distinction between sustainability and regeneration. We can farm our land 
in a sustainable way to maintain the health of the soil as it exists today, keep sustain what we have today. But we can also, if we want to, if we want to regenerate a former condition, it takes a lot of effort to do it, but it is possible to go back to a former time the way it was a long time ago. We can regenerate if we want to. It's, it takes a lot of effort. And, and an, as an example of how we, pardon me just a moment. I'm sorry. It's okay. Sorry. Um, it's my office landline. Um, I'm gonna go back about 250 years to Albert Daniel Teer, T-H-A-E-R, who was a medical doctor in Northeastern, well, what was then Prussia is now Germany. And what I was told when I had my sabbatic leave at Humboldt in Berlin in the mid nineties uh, from a very close friend who took me there when, when the professor, Dr. Frank Elmer knew that I was interested in this subject that you're, you're, you and your friends are also interested in. He said, Bob, you need to know about Tear, Albrecht Daniel Tear, a medical, he was a medical doctor who made a decision that he could help his people a lot more if he grew, if he could figure out how to grow the right kind of food crops for his people. So he took off his, his medical gown and started doing some agricultural research. And if you go northeast of Berlin about, oh, I think it's about 125 kilometers, you come to Moglen, it's M-O-E-G-L-N, it's an umlaut O, you come to the location of a facility that is very similar to what we have at, at our Center for Environmental Farming Systems down in Goldsboro, very similar kinds of research. And out of that work um, at Moglane over more than 200 years came to be known the seven crop rotational sequence. Mm -hmm. Four legumes always, depending on the location there in Northeastern Germany, it, would, it might be a, a particular mix of legumes. Another location, a different mix of legumes four legume crops and three non-legume crops, cereal grain crops. And what, what was so clear is that if the farmers grew this mix of crops, not only would the soil be healthy, but the people who ate the product of the soil, the plants that they grew, the people would be healthier also. And when I learned that, I started doing some research on the influence of soil health on the health of plants, and the health of the people who eat the plants. And I, I began to realize just how close the connection is, both physically and mentally. Now, I wanna share a story with you, and I know we don't have much time. We have time for a story or two. A number, a number of years ago, I had a student who said, can we take our class, our introductory crop science class on a field trip to my farm in Southern Wake County? Of course we can. What what's your farm? He's asking what his farm is like. We're we're growing a various. You've talked a lot about alfalfa and symbiotic balance for nitrogen fixation. How that's how how that promotes soil health. And I just want you to know we're growing alfalfa for a very special reason. But I'm gonna let my father tell you. So I took my students there, and I saw an incredible alfalfa stand. Unfortunately, we don't grow as much alfalfa today in North Carolina as we did a number of years ago. That's another story that I'd love to share with you if there's time. What I saw that afternoon was a beautiful stand of alfalfa. It was in the springtime, it's a spring semester, and they were starting to do what they call the first cut. Mm -hmm. You can get three or four cuts of alfalfa. The first cut is the healthiest for the animals that eat the forage. So talking with the father, I learned that this alfalfa hay being purchased by a human resource consultants group that works with children whose mental health needs are quite apparent. And there's a, there's a, there's a farm in, in uh, north, uh, north of Crabtree Valley that has horses. You go up Creedmoor Road, horses are on the right, 
and he sells his hay to the horses at uh, Crabtree Valley, Nova Crabtree Valley. And the horses eat this very healthy hay. And what I learned talking to the psychiatrist is that when that hay, that special healthy hay is fed to the horses and then the horses and the children come together, they can learn a lot about the mental and physical well-being of the children by observing the horses. Pardon me just one moment. Yes. You okay? Yeah. I'll make you need. I'm sorry, Susie. I had to take hey. that. Yes. yes, it'll be fine. Um, so that that caused me to start thinking about the connection between soil health, the plants, and the animals that eat, that eat it, and then the, the human being. And that reminded me of where I did my research uh, up at Cornell in what was known as the Plant Soil Nutrition Laboratory. We, we call it the nut lab. We shortened the word nutrition to nut. And the study of the, of the soil, the nutrients that enter the plant, the nutrients from the plant that enter the animal, the nutrients from the animal that enter the human being if the person is eating the animal, all of that came together. And that, that reminded me of some opportunities I had had as a student start to make that connection but then I stepped away from it and focused solely on soybeans and the reason I did my research on soybeans is the following I had learned from a trip over to what was then Zaire Democratic Republic of Congo that when when soybean meal was introduced into what was the common diet for just weaned children the, the Chaluba word is bedia b-e-d-i-a the it's basically corn and cassava. The, the, the addition of soy flour greatly improved the well-being of the children. And that reminded me of a, of a study that was done in Central America a long time ago when a, a, an improvement was made in corn that led to high lysine uh, Y'all know a lot more about this than I do, but there are six or seven dietary essential amino acids. And these, of course, are the amino acids that you and I cannot manufacture at all or it needs equal to our, or our normal growth and development needs. Well, these are these dietary essential amino acids, lysine, methionine, and tryptophan, three of them, are very low in the cereal grains, including corn, but they're very rich in, in legumes. So it all started coming together. But what I had learned back in the mid 90s on my sabbatic leave up at, uh, at the Albert Daniel Tier Institute and what I had learned when I took to my student to the alfalfa farm, what I was learning later was all coming together. And, and here's, here's a story about the experiment that was run in Central America. Two groups of children, two cohorts of just weaned children. One cohort was fed corn, traditional corn. Another cohort, corn, that, in, that was, had double the amount of the essential amino acid lysine as mm -hmm. other as traditional corn. Um, it's called the opaque two gene. There were two scientists, uh, Purdue scientists. One was a biochemist, one was a, was, was, was a geneticist. And they, they found the gene on corn responsible for lysine production. The cohort of children that were fed the diet that included high lysine corn were every year that they tested cognitive potential were statistically superior to the mm. work that was not fed the high lysine corn. And after three years, they decided that they could not continue the study because uh, it was unethical. They didn't think it was appropriate. So, mm. but the, the problem with high lysine corn is that it's a very soft kernel. And if you don't take the crop out of the field immediately when the grain is physiologically mature, the insects love it too, and it's eaten. So they're, they're as, as you folks know very well, when we make a genetic improvement in one way, sometimes there are unintended negative consequences in another way. Mm -hmm. So I, I talked to my students about the importance of including legumes in the crop rotational sequence. And what we know is, that when we do that, the health of our soil improves. One more quick story. 
one of my students wanted to go up to Saybrook, Illinois, uh, when he learned that Herman Warsaw had won the World Corn Championship, won, won the rec set the record. We went up there, and Mr. Herman Warsaw took us on a tour. We went down into a pit that, that had been dug. My student, Wayne Nixon, went down and looked at the roots of the corn plant. He saw something that he didn't understand. Mr. Warsaw, what is that? Wayne, those are earthworm castings. And I can tell how healthy my soil is or how deep in the soil are earthworm castings. If the earthworms are healthy, if the soil is healthy. And if the earthworms and the soil are healthy, I know I'm gonna get a healthy crop of corn. And so the, it's all connected, the biotic and the abiotic components of the soil and the health of the soil, the health of the crop, the health of the person, it's all connected. And this is why we want our students to realize that when you grow a crop on a healthy soil, you're not only improving the market value of your crop that, that season, but you're touching the future. You're improving the well-being of people who will eat that, eat, eat that food that's healthier later, later on. There is no question but that if we let the levels of dietary essential amino acids fall in a crop because of poor soil fertility or other uh, poor soil um, management factors, that when we let the, the essential dietary amino acid levels fall, the food that we eat is compromised. There is a direct connection between the nutrient levels in the soil, the essential plant nutrient elements. These are the elements that the crop cannot complete its life cycle without that there's a very close correlation between the levels of essential plant nutrient elements in the soil and the quality of the, the final product. And at our, um, at our dairy at Lake Wheeler, they're studying this. There are two types of cows, Holstein and Jersey. Now I grew up on a, on a Jersey dairy farm, so I'm, I'm very partial to Jersey cow. By the way, the girls in our lab for some reason, they can't stop petting the Jersey calves. It's something about a Jersey cow. That's horrible. <laughs> so we're, we are studying the effect of different kinds of pasture grasses, different kinds of uh, solid feedstock that will improve both the quality, that will affect, hopefully improve, both the yield and the quality of the milk product. And they're doing that incredible research at Lake Wheeler now. It's wonderful. I, I can't stop talking about some things that, that I'm, that I'm noted that I know we're going to run out of time. Um, your NCSU land acknowledgement statement has had a tremendous impact on me. Yes, our university does sit on land that was originally stewarded by two indigenous tribes. Tuscarora and Catawba. I grew up on land. I farmed land that was originally inhabited by Catawbas, or some people say Catawabas. I will never forget the Beach family uh, nearby. They didn't have land. I had land. Our cattle had land, but the, this family did not have land. And what I remember so well is going into a cave one time in the hills and we, we, we saw bones and I learned later that these were the bones of people who had tried to hide the grain that they had harvested, Native American corn, Native American in people hiding their grain from these people that came in from another place. And there's a connection between the health of the people and the health of the attitude of other people. Um, one, one, one quick story, up at Cornell, I went to the undergraduate Juris Library. They let me, I, I love to go into the archives. I saw a letter a person had written. Uh, this was on Native American land, just the same as in North Carolina. This is up at Ithaca. And what I learned from that letter was that a person from the old world was in that area a long time ago and saw smoke. He wanted to know what the smoke was. So he started walking and someone stopped 
him and said, don't go any further. Why not? I want to know what that smoke is. Well, I'll tell you what it is. It was in the winter time. And Susie, what that person who wrote that letter that I read, what was written was that he learned, he was told that the people who had inhabited that land were burning the, the Native Americans winter store of corn and you get one crop of corn a year. And the, the idea was to weaken them nutritionally. If they don't have anything to eat in the winter time, then we can conquer them more easily. I could share so many stories like this from different places. Yes, we, our university sits on land that once was that way. And when I would hear my friends from, from my part of Catawba County talk about how lucky I should be because I have the opportunity to farm land that their ancestors had, but could no longer farm. That's painful. That is very painful. Um, there are plants that we grow, and then there are plants that are grown where we're growing plants that we try to kill. I'm gonna share one example, yellow nut sedge. We try to kill it. But if you go to Valencia, Spain, you will find that they're doing research on this plant that we call a weed. And they're trying their best to increase the yield and nutritive content in the nutlets in, nut, in yellow nut sage. And the extract from that nutlet is chufa. And what I'm told is that, that it has great value. And also what I learned when I was digging it out of my garden one time and a friend uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a Southeast Asian person came by who got real upset with me for digging up the nut sedge. I had no idea why this person was upset. I learned that in, in many parts of Southeast Asia, the extract from the nutlet of nut sedge, yellow nut, there are two types, yellow and purple. It's the yellow that I'm referring to now, that it's good for, for uh, all kinds of ailments, in, including um, ailments that that can affect you in a serious way. Mm. So there are plants that some people call weeds and other people call valuable resources. And we need to, we need to be careful about this. If you go to Berlin and you go north of, in Mitte, you come to the Berlin Wall Memorial site. Humboldt University students were given the opportunity to decide what one plant would be grown there. That, plant that was chosen was rye. No other plant than rye can be grown at the Berlin Wall Memorial site. So I asked Frank Elmer, why, why, uh, why rye? Bob, this is a nutritious crop that can tolerate the vagaries of nature. It, it is stable. We, we know when a farmer plants rye in this part of the world, we know that we can get a yield. It may not be the highest yield, but we know that it will be a good yield and it will be a quality yield. We plant a particular kind of rye and we're doing research to improve the quality of rye. So in that part of Europe, rye bread is, is the prominent bread. And the reason is because it has a stability and nutritional value that is considered to be very important. When, when um, Craig Yensho in horticulture does his research on, on sweet potato in many parts of the world. Sometimes Craig spends more time overseas than he does on campus. What he's doing is he's improving the beta carotene content, the precursor of vitamin A, which reduces night blindness in children. And I have seen a line of children in, in, in Zaire, this child with, a, with the hands on the shoulders of the one above, the only child that didn't that, that knew where they were going was a child at the head of the group. And I found out from my Peace Corps volunteer, Tom, Tom what's that all about, Bob? These children are, are suffering from blindness. So what was done in 1960 at the International Rice Research Institute in Los Banos in the Philippines was sweet potato was included in a four crop rotational sequence. And when the sweet potato was included, I was told that within a decade, the incidence of night blindness was reduced more than 50%. So our state grows a lot of sweet potatoes. We ship these all over the world. We are touching the future. 
by growing a plant that has enormous nutritional value in the same way that when we grow our other crops. So I think what I wanna say is in conclusion that those of us who are engaged in production agriculture, producing our food, feed, fiber, and specialty crops for us and for animals that eat the crops, we are touching the future in a very special way. The connection between plant health and human health is what it is because of the health of the soil mm. that causes us, the plant to smile when that plant is growing in the right kind of soil. And the right kind of soil is the kind of soil that allows that crop, that season in that environment to achieve as closely as it can to its full genetic potential for that particular growing environment that year. Mm. Well, thank you so much that uh, you always make my heart happy when I talk well, with you. I've overdone it. I <laughs> no, 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 no. I've overdone it as usual. No. Well, I would love to invite anyone who is in the audience. If you have a question, please feel free to type it in the chat box and I'll read them um, to Dr. Patterson so that he will know. Um, if anybody, I think I see Cindy typing something. By the way, if you go to Boku University, but Boden is the word for soil in German, B-O-D-E-N. Boku University in Vienna, you'll go to Eva's garden and Eva says, there, Bob, there, I started to pull up a weed one time. She got upset. She got real angry. Don't you dare to go, Bob, uh, Eva, it's a weed. No, it's, there, there are no weeds in my garden. So then I started investigating. And then I started learning about allelopathy, the chemical influence of one plant on another. And there are more beneficial influences of one plant on another plant than there are negative. Okay, I'll be quiet. <laughs> no, that's okay. Cindy has a question. Um, I um, wanted, to, I have read um, a lot of things like in the popular press about the sort of general depletion of um, nutrients in the soil and sort of soil quality in general, like to the point where even if your lettuce that you buy at the grocery store looks perfectly fine, it doesn't really have the same nutrients as would have in the past. Is that, that is I, that's I, a real concern? Cynthia, that's bothering a lot of us very much. I think that's a genuine concern. There is no question but that soil quality in general, our, where we grow our food crops, is, is, is going down. We are trying our best to, to maintain the humic matter, H-U-M-I-C. The humic matter is a portion of the soil organic matter that is stable over time. And as humic matter falls, so does the nutritional resource, so do the nutritional resources in the soil. And this, the, the consequence is poor quality vegetable products and field crop products. I, I think that what you just said is, is something we need to be very concerned about. There is no question about it. I, a long time ago, I took some plants over to, I'm trying to think, it was over to Shelb Hall. <laughs> and ask a friend to, he was, he was in charge of your, um, of one of your laboratories. I asked him to analyze uh, nutrition well-being of a plant. And he said, Bob, this, this, is, this is the plant has got very, very few dietary essential amino acids. Mm -hmm. It came from a very poor quality soil. And what we try to do in our research stations is it leaves some soils alone. We try to get a contrast. We want to make the comparison and I, and I, took him, I can't think of it a long time ago. I took him some plant material from, from the, what we call very poor soil quality area. And, and there, was, there was a significant difference between the nutritional quality of the vegetables that we took in. And it was, the analysis was done in your laboratory. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a closer connection between your lab and our lab. Well, I, I also echo what Dr. Patterson said that certainly the qual the nutritional quality of produce has been going down over time. And it's always fun to go to a farmer's market where ideally the products have been created um, in healthier soil and, 
and the quality, just the taste alone, but then also the nutritive value is increased. So I'm a big proponent of getting vegetables and fruits at the farmer's market if you can. I'm just going to add to what you said and I'll be quiet. There's a very, I'm convinced that there's a very close correlation between how, how much the earthworms in the soil are smiling, how many earthworm castings you see, and the nutritional value of the vegetables that we eat. Mm. I, the health of the soil is so closely connected with the health of the food we eat from the soil. There's yeah. no question about it. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I, you know, I could talk to you for hours, but today we only had 30 minutes, but I wanted to say thank you so much to Dr. Patterson. And I do have a few little concluding remarks for our audience that um, we meet every third Friday of the month at 2 p.m. And next show will include an interview from Dr. Vanessa Vlope. Um, from the Department of Psychology, and she'll be discussing her work in the Black Health Lab. So um, you can find more information in about this web series, as well as the recordings from past web series on the Wolfpack Wellness website. And I am your host, Dr. Susie Goodell, and until next time, be well. Thanks very much.